I am proud to present to you the president of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Foundation, responsible for raising the funds, shaking all the trees, and erecting the monument to our brother, Dr. King. Brother Harry, if you would please come forward. And also, I, amen, come on, come on up. And joining, I'm gonna get out to you with that. And joining Brother Harry, we are also delighted to have our regional vice president. This is the southern region of Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, Brother Kelsey Rushing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, what a joy it is for me to be in the house of the Lord on this day. You know, Pastor and First Lady, I don't take it lightly. I had to tell my wife on Friday, I got a call from the general president and he asked me to go to Durham. She said, what are you going to Durham for? I said, I'm supposed to present something to Andy Young. She said, but don't he live in Durham? I said, yeah, but he called me to fly from Houston to be here, so guess what? I am here. Because that's what past general presidents do. First Lady Michelle Augustine, and to the officers and members of this great church, you're getting ready to celebrate 150 years. How proud you should be uh, that this church has been standing here for 150 years serving this community. To my brothers in Alpha Phi Alpha, it's always a pleasure to be with you and to see you, Brother Kelsey Rushing, the Southern Regional Vice President, to be here with you as well. And the Honorable, the Honorable Andrew Young, what do you say about him? I greet you all in the name of Jesus. And I say to you from a very personal perspective that today represents a great intersection between myself and uh, Andy Young. In addition to being the 31st general president, I also had the honor of serving as president, as the pastor said, of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial Project, where we successfully raised funds to erect the memorial to Dr. King. Many of you gave your nickels, dimes, and quarters, and dollars to build that memorial. And together, we raised $127 million to erect the memorial of Dr. King. We did so without nobody, uh, Madam District Attorney, going to jail. <laughs> nobody looking like they going to jail. And we did so because of a dear friend and alpha brother who's with us today, if I may take a point of personal privilege. Richard W. Marshall is here. He was our CFO for the project. <laughs> brother Young, we could not have done this without you. You were the co-chair of our ELC, and like you, you understood big dollars. Alphas understood how to pick up a dollar or two, but Brother Young and Mr. Marshall understood uh, millions of dollars, so we were able to do that project and raise that money. Because of you and because of where that memorial stands on the pantheon of leadership of our great country, between Lincoln and Jefferson, there is a black man. He is there forever and ever. It has become the fifth most visited memorial in these United States. Dr. King's legacy will always be remembered as one of fighting for civil rights and social justice. One of those with whom he was closest to his most trusted lieutenant was an Alpha brother that we honor today, the Honorable Andy Young. We honor Ambassador Young because of his 70 years of service to Alpha Phi Alpha. Now, Understanding that he got initiated past the J where you were at Beta Chapter and Beta Chapter and how you just believe they are Alpha Chapter and Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> they really believe that. They really believe that. But there's something that has been instilled in all Alpha men. And I'm not just pointing out Alpha men, but all of our fraternities and sororities and, and organizations. Something instilled in us to understand the livelihood and what our purpose is. But Andy Young, and a personal story was, I, I could talk about how I met him when I was a college student at Xavier, but we're not here for that. But you know about Alpha Phi Alpha because a few years ago, we went to visit one of our past general presidents, Ozell Sutton. And Ozell was in the hospital, and so we were there visiting Ozell. And to tell you what kind of alpha man Andrew Young is, as we sat there, we prayed, we talked to Ozell, Andy just started singing, and I dear... 
Hey, And then Ozell's eyes popped up. And then we all just started crying. <laughs> but that's the kind of brother that we honor today. His 70 years of being in this fraternity. How proud we are from the fraternal standpoint to announce the formation of the fraternity's newest initiative, the Andrew Young Social Justice Institute, an initiative that will exist into perpetuity to perpetually honor your work, Ambassador Young, your life's work, your legacy, and your name. Let us give him a round of applause for that. Yes. So this institute will be housed at the with the National Chaplain's Office of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity uh, to actually bring organizations, faith-based organizations, and other community stakeholders in our local communities to bring attention and address pressing social issues such as maybe it's a water crisis in Flint, maybe it's the education system here and around the country, but that's the purpose of this institute. We thank the fighting and good spirits as exemplified by Andy Young. On behalf of Alpha Phi Alpha, the Vice President, Chaplain, and our General President, all brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha, please stand that we announce the formation of the Andrew Young Social Justice Institute as we honor one of Alpha's greatest brothers, Ambassador Andrew J. Young, on the seventh year of his service to our fraternity. Thank you very much. You know, I think back 70 years, and I went to college very young, <laughs> very wild, very crazy, uh, and I had a ball. <laughs> and I think had it not been for running into a group of brothers, uh, that taught me about manly deeds, scholarship, love for all mankind. If I had not been associated with the value system of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, and I'd say all of the fraternities and sororities in our society uh, are built on a value system a value system that is not a part of the Constitution or the government uh, or the secular world for the most part. But there is an ideal of brotherhood and sisterhood that makes us all children of the living God. Amen. Now Martin Luther King used to say, we are not just fighting to sin like white people sin. <laughs> if that's what you want is equality, you're on the wrong train. That um, by and large, we have been called to a higher standard. We look at the sufferings of our ancestors and we wonder why people treated them so mean, but look again yesterday and today and you see why our men are so strong. And you see why our women are so loving and beautiful and, and how they adjust and adapt and excel every time they've been given a chance. And from Althea Gibson to Coco, uh, little Coco, big Coco. <laughs> You, you see that there's something special in our gene pool. But that is not taught in most of our schools and colleges and graduate institutions. We've almost got to keep that alive ourselves. And so a center for justice 
is also a center for mercy for us. And because there can be no justice without mercy. Uh, and um, the verse goes, what does the Lord require of thee but to love mercy, do justly. And the other one is the most important in some ways. Walk humbly with our God. Martin Luther King was the most humble person I think I know. And he never wanted to fight for credit. He never wanted to do anything that he got credit for. And he always shared that credit and pushed it to the other organizations. Even when he won the Nobel Prize, he divided up the money between all of the civil rights organizations. And so there's a sense of unity and humility that I think is important in this day and time, even as much as our concepts of justice and equality. There's one other thing I'll say, and that is that um, Frederick Douglass understood that giving slaves the right to vote was not enough. And he moved to get Lincoln to organize the Freedmen's Bank that along with the right to vote and the right to democratic participation, we've got to have an equal opportunity with the money. And that equal opportunity doesn't depend on government distribution of wealth. It depends on our spiritual and our mental ability to generate wealth and to participate in the wealth engineering society of which we're a part. Now, quite often we get in that part of the society and we forget the other part. But there's also a concept in our heritage of a talented 10th that must never forget the 90% who have been left in slavery. And that's why the fraternal orders and the social organizations uh, are so important in our society. We gotta understand, well, let me just say about our mayor. We elected a young woman mayor and people were upset when they found out that she had a million dollar home in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and when I looked into it, I realized that she and her husband had adopted four children. And they came out of law school and he went to work with Home Depot. And Home Depot was paying off in shares of $2 a share. Now, nobody know, questions the fact that the man who started Home Depot now owns the Falcons. And he's making plenty of money regardless of whether they're winning. <laughs> but this young brother started buying these shares at $2 a share. And I think you can check almost any day, but they're running close to $200 a share. So while he was working for money, he understood how to make money work for him. <laughs> and that's where our call to justice comes in this hour. Dr. King said we were to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Well, the only way to get out of poverty is to understand money, to save money, to understand work to realize that your money can work for you more and make more than you can make working for your money. And your credit score is as important as your right to vote. Now this church has always understood, in fact, you cannot be a member of the AME church unless you're a registered voter. I think this is the only church that has the right to vote in the discipline. But the AME church and Frederick Douglass also understood the importance of letting the dollar work for you. 
And more and more as we see the wealth, in fact, I was with the president of Nigeria the other day, and I was bragging that me and Maynard have probably made several hundred millionaires in Atlanta. Maynard Jackson, a graduate of this community in uh, North Carolina Central Law School. And because we didn't bother with Washington, we went to Wall Street and we made Wall Street in help us invest in our airport and the like. And that's why it's the busiest in the world and doesn't cost the taxpayers a penny. That's what we mean by justice. And part of that is having a AAA bond rating. Now, a AAA bond rating for me and you is a credit score of at least 700. And if your credit score is down below 700, you pay it almost twice as much as you pay for credit if your credit score is up. So we've got a lot to share. And that's, I think, the work of the kingdom in this hour. The AME Church has always been there. And um, our fraternal and sorority and family organizations, I think I'm related to everybody. And uh, Mama was one of the founders of the Lynx in New Orleans back when it first started, and my wife and my daughters and everybody, you know, so the Lynx and the Alphas, and I was even Omega Man of the Year one year. <laughs> <laughs> and the next year, the Kappas made me Man of the Year. <laughs> so we're all one family under God with liberty and justice and money for all, hopefully. <laughs> oh, you can do better than that now, because the God we serve is able, and God is worthy to be praised. With protocol having been established and with our hour having been well spent, it is preaching time. Now I'm not going to hold you. In the, in the words of Elizabeth Taylor to her fourth or her fifth husband, I won't hold you long. Let's take a minute now and pray and go before God and ask for God's blessing in the preaching of this word. Heads are now bowed, eyes are now closed. Precious and wonderful God, I thank you for another opportunity, dear God, to proclaim your precious and your holy word. I thank you, dear God, for this day that you have made. We are rejoicing, dear God, and we are glad in it. Now, dear God, please show up in the form of your Holy Spirit. Preach a word from on high, dear God, so that souls may be saved and people may be brought closer unto you. These and all of the blessings now we ask in the perfect, the precious, the matchless, and the marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Join me, please, in the book of Haggai. Minor prophet, following the major prophets toward the end of the Old Testament, our brother Haggai, in the second chapter, the third through the ninth verses, I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Haggai, the second chapter, the third through the ninth verses. If you have it now, please say amen. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from the New Revised Standard Version. Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now, take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak the high priest. Take courage, all of you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, mm -hmm. says the Lord of hosts. According to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit abides among you. Do not fear. For thus, says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth 
and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of the nation shall come. And I will fill this house with splendor, mm -hmm. says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, my, my, my. says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For just a few moments this morning, I want to talk with you from the topic, make the church great again. Make the church great again. This morning marks the third Social Justice Sunday celebration for this conference year here at St. Joseph AME Church. Each of the two previous celebrations have been thematic in that they focused around a central theme. And this morning's celebration is no exception. On June 23rd, we opened the doors of the church to the entire city as we celebrated the heroism of one of our own, Sister Virginia Williams. Because of her heroism, along with six others, including the Reverend Douglas Moore, St. Joseph told a story of civil disobedience through Durham's Royal Ice Cream Sit-In of 1957, setting the stage for the Greensboro Lunch Counter Sit-Ins of 1960 and the Freedom Rides of 1961. The Daniel III story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego teaches us the same lesson that Sister Williams demonstrated in 1957. Social justice means oppressed people should never have to bow down to unjust laws. Amen. On August the 25th, just three days prior to the August 28th anniversary of the March on Washington, our congregation welcomed your link sister and your HU sister, United States Senator Kamala Harris, a candidate for the presidency of the United States of America. We looked at the prophet Jeremiah in the eighth chapter of the book bearing his name as we asked the question, is there a bomb in Gilead? In talking about jobs, justice, and education, we recognize that Jeremiah was calling on all of us to organize ourselves, to help ourselves in the midst of a situation. Jeremiah's situation dealt with the destruction of Jerusalem and the worst predicament they had ever seen. This morning now, on this third Social Justice Sunday, just a few days after the elections in Virginia and Kentucky that are supposed to be a road map for a shift of power that's going to occur in the United States exactly one year from now, this congregation welcomes one of America's most profound social justice figures, the Honorable Andrew Young, an ordained minister who's also a former organizing lieutenant of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's a former member of Congress, a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, and former mayor of Atlanta. Let me be clear. Brother Young, you represent the best that the church produces when it comes to social justice. In the image of an Old Testament prophet, and in the image of Jesus, Brother Young's ministry has been to speak truth to power and speak out on behalf of those who have been pushed to the margins and oppressed. The issue, however, hmm, this morning, the issue becomes one of celebrating the glory days of the past while simultaneously dealing with the reality of our present. In the past, the church was a rallying beacon of hope as we marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on a day that was dubbed as Bloody Sunday, demanding the right to vote. In the present, however, the church has been largely silent as unarmed black people are still being killed by police officers as brown people are being held in cages at the U.S.-Mexico border, and as an unabashed Archie Bunker-type bigot occupies the White House, having run a campaign on a mantra saying, let's make America great again. 
this morning, my brothers and sisters, on this third Social Justice Sunday, as we look at and celebrate some of the best of the church's past, our rallying cry is hope for our future. As we collectively commit to working together, to working with one another, to rebuild what we had in the past, but to go forward with a hope and with an optimism that says the best surely is up ahead in our future and the best is yet to come. Therefore, in taking a page from the playbook of the prophet Haggai, as we focus on the theme of hope this morning for Social Justice Sunday, I want to talk about the topic, make the church great again. When we look at this text now, we are preaching this morning from one of the least talked about minor prophets in the history of Jerusalem. Haggai is not called a minor prophet because he's insignificant. He's called a minor prophet because the book bearing his name is just shorter than some of the others. Haggai writes this book to provide hope to people who are dealing with despair at a time when Jews were just starting to return to Jerusalem. After all of the destruction caused by King Nebuchadnezzar entering the Babylonian exile. In other words... Haggai is writing this text in contemporary application to folks who are from New Orleans, trying to return after a wicked woman wreaked unthinkable destruction. Her name was Hurricane Katrina. Haggai is writing this text to the people of Houston who are trying to return after holy havoc caused by Hurricane Harvey. Or maybe best said, Haggai is writing this text to a people who are looking for hope after their entire way of life has been attacked by a shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Or after people have been attacked because of their ethnicity by a shooting at a Walmart shopping store in El Paso, Texas. What I'm trying to say is that Haggai is writing this text to remind people of the glories of the past, but to also give them hope. For their future. Now, there's a certain tension in this text. There's a tension in this text because there's a disconnect between the reality of what was and the potential of what can be. Haggai asked the question in verse 3 Who among you saw this house in its former glory? Now, I like to always say we can look at a biblical text. In at least two ways. We can look at the text literally, but we can also look at the text figuratively or symbolically. Now, by looking at this text literally, we do indeed get an accurate historical picture of Haggai giving hope to a people who were rebuilding their cherished temple in Jerusalem. But by looking at this text figuratively, by looking at this text symbolically, we have a better ability to apply this text to our lives. The Jewish temple was not only a beautiful and ornate structure, it was also fundamental to Jewish culture and their everyday life, just like the black church has always been fundamental and a part of our everyday life. The temple represented a promise of hope that went back to Jesus's most famous ancestor, King David, and was fulfilled through David's son, King Solomon. So by therefore destroying the temple during the Babylonian exile, Nebuchadnezzar not only succeeded in destroying a building, he was also trying to destroy people's hope. In other words, by asking the question, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Haggai might as well be asking, are there any among you that remember the leadership that resulted in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 actually came from the church? Is there anyone among you who remembers, to paraphrase Andrew Young in his book, An Easy Burden, that because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and because it wasn't enough, it was ministers and committed laity who worked together, who fought together to pass a Voting Rights Act of 1965? Or, to put it in terms of another generation that watches movies, perhaps instead of reading, hey guy is asking the question, How many of you know that in the movie Selma, the day that they marched that became known as Bloody Sunday, they actually met at our sister congregation, Brown Chapel AME Church at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. 
What I'm trying to say is that by drawing attention to the past, Haggai is reminding of us of, of reminding us of a time when the church dealt not just with salvation in the kingdom to come, but he's also reminding us of a time when the church dealt with social inequity, dealt with fair housing, dealt with fair wages and fair people getting a fair shake in the kingdom at hand. Oh, the church is great, my brothers and sisters, because it's a place where we can always talk about the fact that Jesus died and Jesus got up. But the church has also got to be great because not only did Jesus die, Jesus also lived. Hmm? And Jesus lived a life as a preacher who refused to color inside of the lines because Jesus was focused on social justice. Jesus was concerned about classism. Jesus was concerned about racism. And Jesus was concerned about the least of these having access to universal health care long before Barack Obama became president of the United States in 2008. Huh? By therefore directing our attention to the past and by asking the question, who remembers this house in its former glory? Haggai is really asking the question, who remembers the church? At her greatest. All right, all right. Now, just like there's a tension in the text, there's also a tension in our time. There's a tension in our time because of the partisan politics of evangelicalism and the conservative right wing agenda that have focused so much on appointing Supreme Court justices that will overturn Roe v. Wade. We've turned a blind eye to character and competency and given the White House to a nut by the name of Donald Trump. <laughs> There's a tension in our time because in 2008 and in 2012, America really did seem to hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equally. Hmm? When America elected and re-elected Barack Obama as the first black president of these United States of America. America seemed as though it really did hold these truths to be self-evident that when a black man named Eric Holder became attorney general of these United States, he was followed by the second African-American attorney general, a black woman who happens to be from Durham, North Carolina, by the name of Loretta Lynch. Hmm? Oh, America was holding these truths to be evident when the president's cabinet was the most diverse in American history based on ethnicity and based on gender, and America's leadership really looked like America's population. The sad thing is, the presidency of Barack Obama seems like it was a long, 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 time ago <laughs> there's a there's a tension in our time because when the supreme court invalidates provisions of the voting rights act the same voting rights act that members of the church work, work to pass they are not only destroying a law but it feels like they are attempting to destroy the significance of black people when the current occupant of the White House is celebrated by some evangelical leaders when they defend his unchristian like actions by saying Donald Trump is a Christian, I am reminded that it's Jesus the Christ who teaches us the parable of the Good Samaritan in response to the lawyer's question, and who is my neighbor? Yeah. Oh, I guess under this administration, your neighbor better not be Muslim because we'll lock your neighbor up and call it the war against terrorism. Your neighbor better not be from Mexico because we separate migrant children from their families at the border in the name of something called immigration reform. Hmm? And your neighbor sure enough better not be from Africa because we already know all people from Africa are from you know what whole countries. Just like Haggai is riding to Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple at one of the lowest times in its history, America has also fallen a mighty, mighty long way since the presidency of Barack Obama. We're at one of the lowest points in our history, too. But the good news is there's always grace. The good news is that God will always show up in the midst of your situation, huh? God is showing up to give hope in the midst of despair. No matter how bad things looked in Jerusalem in their present, Haggai was saying, hold on to your hope because we serve an awesome kind of God. We serve a God who's going to do show up and show out and a God whose greatness is in the future more so than in the past. God is going to bless you with splendor in your future. In verse 9, Haggai writes, 
the latter splendor of this house shall be even greater than the former. Meaning, if you can just hold on to your hope, no matter what your situation might look like right now, the best is truly yet to come. Hope means hmm, everybody in here wasn't always in the links. Everybody in here wasn't always in a fraternity. And let the truth be known, everybody in here wasn't always in the church. Huh? Hope means no matter what your situation looks like, you've got to believe in your heart that your best is yet to come. Hey, guy might as well be writing in this text as we're approaching the holiday season to remind someone who is lamenting that the glory days of the past, because you want to restore a broken relationship with someone in your family as you look forward to your future. Hmm. Hey, guy is writing in this text to somebody who's dealing with financial challenges. Oh, I like to always say that money sometimes can get funny hmm? and change sometimes can get strange. Hey, guy is writing to somebody who's dealing with prosperity preachers telling us to name it and claim it hmm? and fake it until you make it. So when somebody who really cares comes up and asks how you doing in the midst of your situation, you respond by saying I'm blessed and highly favored, huh? Hey, guy is telling us in this text that no matter what your situation looks like right now, hold on to your hope. Because in the words of the hymn writer, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I will not trust the sweetest flame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, all of the ground, all of the ground is sinking sand. Hey, guy is telling us, hold on to your hope. Now, just like there's God's grace in this text, we also see God's grace in our time. No matter what your situation looks like as we're dealing with despair. In 2016, after eight years of no drama Obama, and at a time of unprecedented prosperity that returned America from the worst recession since the Great Depression, America sent a xenophobic bigot who bragged about sexually exploiting women to the White House with an agenda that labeled anyone who was against him or anyone who dared to report the truth as pushing fake news. All while he incited violence against ethnic and religious minorities. From my perspective, my brothers and my sisters, America hit a place of despair. Yeah. Yeah. But in the midst of our issues, in the midst of our despair, in the midst of managing our situation, we have seen hope. Hmm? We've seen hope at polling places all across America. We've seen hope at polling places even in the Deep South. Even in the ruby red state of Alabama, they elected a Democrat named Doug Jones to the United States Senate in December of 2017 to fill the seat of Jeff Sessions. Eleven months later in the November 2018 midterm elections, a whole lot of people got a whole lot of hope because America elected the most diverse Congress in the history of these United States of America. We elected more women to office. We elected more ethnic minorities. We elected more religious minorities. And more and more people were open and out about their sexuality and who they really are because they realized it matters not so much who you are. It matters whose you are because we all are God's children and we all are saved by God's grace. There was even hope last week in the bluegrass state of Kentucky when voters showed up and showed out and showed the unpopularity not only of the man sitting in the White House, but they showed the unpopularity of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell as they elected a progressive Democrat as their governor who's going to be a leading force in the November 2020 elections as we elect a new president of these United States of America. No matter what your situation looks like and no matter how bad things may seem, hold on to your hope. Work collaborative with others. Work to make the church a place not just of worship, but a place of organizing. And whatever you do, make the church great again. I want to close now by briefly telling you a story that I pray will bring together the significance of what we share today. 
I am blessed to be a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha. And I'm blessed as I'm here with a brother who brought me into the fraternity. His brother used to lay hands on me. Brother Darius Jerome Gordine used to lay hands. Y'all catch that on the way home. <laughs> when I went out for Alpha at Howard, I will share with you that we learned about famous Alphas. Martin Luther King Jr. was on that list. But we learned about famous Beta Brothers. Of course, Andrew Young was on that list. Of course, U.S. Senator Edward Brooke was on that list. Of course, musician Donnie Hathaway was on that list. Of course, his Dean of Pledges, David Dinkins, was on that list. But also on that list was a brother who I got to know later in whose life, his work really changed my life because he gave me and gave a whole bunch of people hope. The premier researcher of African presence in the Bible is a beta brother by the name of Cain Hope Felder. I recently participated in his celebration of life. Brother Felder and I got a chance to spend some time together at the Beta Chapter Centennial in 2007. You wouldn't believe who was the speaker for the occasion. Brother Felder was telling folks about his name. That's a strange name when you think about it. Cain Hope. Watch this. Hope in the midst of your despair. Brother Felder's name comes about because his uncle was his father. Watch this. Because his father was really his uncle. What are you saying, preacher? You talk about having to deal with a situation? His mother told him as a child, I've named you Cain because I was raped by my husband's brother. Am I making sense now? She said, it's like killing a brother, so the first name I gave you is Cain. But she said, don't you worry about that. You work with that middle name, because I also named you Hope. Hope always exists in the midst of despair if you're willing to put your trust in God. And because he put his trust in God, he gave a whole bunch of other people hope. Hold on to your hope and make the church great again. <laughs>